miles of land with no clouds in the sky. A little scorpion digs itself underground to escape the heat. No trees or bushes as far as the eye can see. A desert wasn't always like this. Most of them used to be covered with lush green and thick vegetation. Each desert is unique in its own way. It's defined as an area that receives less than 10 inches of rainfall per year. So, with barely any water to support life, the atmosphere is prone to extreme shifts of temperature. That's why a desert can be scorching hot during the day, but the temperatures drop significantly at night. As soon as the sun sets, all the heat disappears, since there's no atmospheric moisture to trap it inside. Jungles and rainforests stay warm at night, since the humidity acts as a net trapping the heat. These dry lands are a result of rain shadow. It's part of the weather cycle that creates precipitation. Damp, warm wind blowing from a certain direction hits a mountain and slowly rises up to form clouds. But as it goes higher, it begins to cool, which makes it release moisture. It's technically fog. So, as a result, the other side of the mountain can't retain any humidity. That's how it turns dry and barren. If we look at this on a regional scale, then you'd notice that deserts aren't even located near the mountains. A high-pressure system is when a flow of dry air remains near the surface. They can be found in subtropical or desert places. If the high-pressure system is consistent, then it's not easy for the opposite effect to take place, which causes typical weather patterns. Many deserts aren't even covered in sand. When walking through a desert, you're stepping on millions of years of nature doing its job. When the days are boiling hot and the nights teeth-chattering cold, the rocks tend to break down easily. The dryness and winds cause erosion and contribute to breaking down these rocks, exposing the bedrock underneath. And as time goes on, the rocks get smaller and smaller until the sand is produced. The larger chunks of sand sink to the bottom, while the smaller grain-like pieces remain on top. The wind transfers the sand in multiple directions and on other larger rocks. Over time, the sand constantly rubbing against the rocks will help it erode it until one day that rock will turn into sand. Dunes are the ocean waves of the desert. Sand dunes are unique in that they don't have a consistent shape. One day, you may see a dune sea in front of you, and the next day, it can be gone. Sand almost behaves like water. Try taking some dry sand with one hand and hold a fist. You'll notice the sand leaking out of your control as it spills. Sand is an accumulation of ground-up rocks shaped by the environment, wind, and gravity. Sand dunes can be found wherever there is a large plain of land and wind. So, beaches, deserts, and even abandoned farmlands have them. You can point out certain dunes depending on the vegetation. So, the ones on the beach have different composition and are smaller. But the ones that cover more ground have a flat or rippled surface. In such places, you can find sand sheets that stretch for miles ahead. Sandstorms form closer to the edges of the desert rather than in the middle. With no vegetation to shield and limit the storms, they can get pretty big. The wind starts off slow and then picks up pace, carrying many particles and exposing the ground below. The rest of the particles lying on the ground begin to vibrate. The stronger the wind, the more sand will be in your face. So the particles all bump into each other and carry the rest of them in the air. The sandstorm can be so huge that it blocks out the sun. In 2001, a sandstorm in China moved an estimated 6.5 million tons, covering an area of around 52 million square miles. About 80% of deserts aren't covered with sand, but rather with barren earth. With no plants and rainfall, the sun just bakes the ground as it is and holds everything in place. You can find hills and rock formations in deserts, many of them shaped by erosion. Some deserts have small mountains, too, and depending on the geologic elements, the color and hardness of the rock vary. But not any sandy patch of land is a real desert. The common ones are composed mainly of sand. There are some that are classified as pebble deserts, rock deserts, and even snow and ice ones. Cold deserts are found all over the world. The Gobi Desert, the coastal desert of Peru and northern Chile have those. There is no humidity around these places, so moisture can't be contained to make clouds. The biggest desert in the world is the whole continent of Antarctica. This giant icy wasteland has no rainfall, but dry winds similar to those in hot deserts. Ice and snow cover almost every square inch of the place that's only habitable by scientists and researchers, and a bunch of penguins. 
In the Sahara Desert, nomadic tribes wander around from place to place. They've been there for thousands of years and only know the desert life. It's estimated that there are only 2.5 million people living there, excluding the Nile Valley. That's one person per square mile. In the past, the Sahara had a lot more people. Evidence of stone artifacts and even art designed on rocks were found in various places. But those places are dried up, uninhabitable areas. Fossils show that the Sahara was once a large network of rivers and lakes, occupied by ancient extinct marine animals. That was millions of years ago. But just around 7,000 years ago, the Sahara was more vibrant with buffaloes, giraffes, elephants, and other animals that are currently found elsewhere in Africa. The people back then used to live near large Saharan lakes and relied on fishing for food. They created settlements around them while defending themselves from animal threats. A lot of those rivers dried up, but many remain as oases. An oasis is an area that has a fresh water source and fertile soil surrounded by dryness. People of the Sahara grew crops and planted trees for dates around the perimeter to prevent sand from contaminating the water and destroying the crops. Some of the water was brought in through irrigation of larger rivers or natural springs. There were also underground sources of water. The oasis could be as little as only a few date palms around the body of water to an entire city. They were perfect trading routes for merchants and nomads, often dealing dates, olives, figs, and other commodities. The settlers maintained the oasis for generations until now. Despite the oasis, there were still some nomads wandering around. But both settlers and nomads had domesticated livestock. Saharan people are still specialists when it comes to moving around. Many of them are trained blacksmiths or agriculturalists that follow to where they can thrive and prosper. Even though the desert climate and conditions are hostile for living beings, there are plenty of plants and animals that specialize in such conditions. The Attix antelope is a unique creature that's currently endangered. Its coat is unmistakable, and its horns are beautifully designed. Cool desert snakes that slither sideways disguise themselves in the same color as the sand. If the desert was the ocean, then camels would be the boats. Their humps store fat to cool themselves off when it gets too hot. The two-humped camel isn't native to the Middle East or Africa, but Mongolia and northern China. They have two rows of eyelashes for protection and can close and open their nostrils at will. No desert is complete without scorpions. They're extremely common in the Sahara and can grow to the size of your palm. Let's not forget the animals of the frozen deserts. Penguins are common in the Antarctic, as well as the Arctic fox and polar bears. Deserts don't technically grow in size just because sand spreads further. It works when the ecosystem takes over another land by decreasing vegetation and removing the fertile soil. And then you have more desert. One of the most unexplored and mysterious places on Earth is located in plain sight. It's one of the most majestic monuments of humankind. The wonder of the ancient world hides a secret that scientists and archaeologists still can't solve. This is the Great Sphinx of Giza in Egypt. The huge sculpture of a lion with a human head was carved out of rock about four and a half thousand years ago. Scientists still don't know the exact date of its creation and are also unaware of who built it and what for. There are many assumptions and theories, but none of them has been confirmed. Most people have seen this majestic sculpture either in photographs or in reality, but almost no one knows what's hidden underneath it. The statue of the Sphinx was carved from a single piece of limestone. It was painted. The remains of color pigment on the surface prove this. In the distant past, the Sphinx looked much brighter and more colorful than what we see now. But even after thousands of years, its greatness hasn't diminished. And by the way, Sphinx is not the real name. It was invented by the Greeks about a hundred years or more after its creation. Initially, the Egyptians called the statue hor em -Akit. There are many legends and theories saying the Sphinx is there for a reason. It's like a watchdog that guards the tomb of the pharaoh and the secrets of ancient Egypt. These legends become more plausible when archaeologists discovered hidden entrances at the feet of the Sphinx. 
They believe that these secret passages are the beginning of the tunnels leading to the halls with treasures. You can find a lot of stories on the internet that claim the Sphinx hides the Hall of Records, a repository filled with ancient and secret knowledge. One of the main artifacts of this repository is supposed to be the records of the ancient mythical state of Atlantis. According to legends, the entire library from this city was moved under the Sphinx. The entrance to this library must be located next to the Sphinx's right paw. Many archaeologists tried to find this entrance, but came away empty-handed. Also, there are many images with detailed diagrams of the underground city that consists of a network of tunnels and chambers under the Sphinx. Someone says there are structures as tall as 12-story buildings hiding underground, but there's no evidence of this. Archaeologists, even after millennia, continue to explore the mysterious sculpture. At the same time, many Egyptians don't want to learn more about the Sphinx. They're terrified of awakening something supernatural. In 1998, scientists discovered tunnels leading to empty caves under the Sphinx. They found evidence of earlier excavations there. It's quite possible that someone managed to find the treasures and take them away. Some people believe Egyptians found some kind of artifact under the Sphinx that has the power of unknown advanced technologies. The artifact is so powerful that it can change the course of history. Of course, most theories are just fairy tales of conspiracy fans, but it's a confirmed fact that the Sphinx hides a system of caves and rooms. There are so many rumors surrounding the Sphinx that it's impossible to understand what's true and what's false. In any case, it's difficult and dangerous to study the sculpture because active excavations can destroy it. And then the entrance to the underground rooms can get blocked by rocks and lost forever. Also, further exploration requires a lot of money and financing is not always easy to find. But the main reason? It's too risky. There's no guarantee that people will be able to get out of the underground labyrinths. For these reasons, scientists and archaeologists have been exploring this majestic structure for so long. Another famous architectural monument with a secret is Mount Rushmore in South Dakota. Everyone admires the images of the U.S. president's faces carved into the rock, but few people know that there's a secret room hidden behind the head of Abraham Lincoln. The architect of Mount Rushmore wanted to carve slabs on the rock with the record of the main stages of the country's history. But his plan was too complicated to carry out. Then he was offered to implement it on a much smaller scale, to build a secret room inside the mountain. The idea was to save this knowledge so that future generations will always remember the history of their country. Unfortunately, the architect didn't have time to finish his work. The construction stopped for several decades. But in the late 90s, the project was resumed. Porcelain enamel panels depicting the history of the U.S. were placed in the room. It's possible that these plates will be stored there forever. But people can't see them, at least for now. The room is inaccessible to tourists as it's too difficult to get inside. Another secret room is located in the Empire State Building. More precisely, it's not even a room, but a place where you can take cool photos. Almost all tourists gather on the observation deck of the 86th floor to enjoy a stunning view of Manhattan. But there's another deck with panoramic windows on the 102nd floor. There are way fewer people there because almost no one knows about that place. Fortunately, access to this deck is open to everyone. You probably won't have to wait in line for a long time to take a photo. You'll feel special because you're in such a secret place where there are almost no people. But the coolest place is even higher, on the 103rd floor. This is a spacious observation deck where celebrities get their photographs taken. It's not a public place, but if you know the right people, you can get there. There are almost no security measures on the site. Only a low ledge between you and an abyss. That's why crowds of people are forbidden from coming here. It's not so easy to get there. 
and you're unlikely to succeed without a guide. First, you need to choose the right elevator that will take you there. Then you'll go through several engineering rooms filled with pipes, electrical panels, and other technical stuff. The final part of your way is a set of stairs inside a tiny corridor. And here you are, at the top of New York. Now we're in Paris. <laughs> See the Eiffel Tower? Inside it, there are restaurants and observation decks. But if you try hard, you can find a secret apartment. Now it's a museum, but it was built so that people could live in it. The architect of the tower, Gustav Eiffel, created this apartment in 1889 for himself. It's almost at the very top of the Eiffel Tower. Imagine what a beautiful view he observed every day. He was the first and only tenant. No one else could gain access to this place. When the architect passed away, the apartment remained empty for a long time. Only recently, they restored it and turned it into a museum. Inside, the epoch of the last century is recreated. They even put wax figures of Gustav Eiffel, his daughter, and the American inventor Thomas Edison inside the room. This place is filled with an endless stream of passengers, office workers running late, visitors from other cities, noise, and train whistles. At Grand Central Station in New York, among all these sounds, you can hear the sound of a ball hitting a racket, if you're in the right place. A real tennis court is hidden inside New York Central Station. It belongs to a tennis club that arranges corporate games for employees of many companies. The club was opened in the 60s. Now we're moving to London, Charing Cross Road. It isn't easy to find one secret place here. To do this, you need to look carefully at your feet. Do you see these sewer grates in the asphalt? Inside them, you can notice two signs with the name Little Compton Street. Yeah, there's another street right below you. It disappeared from all maps at the end of the 19th century. Charing Cross Road was built over it. The identification signs that you see are part of old engineering tunnels. There's another interesting place in London. It's located in the southeast corner of Trafalgar Square. At first glance, it looks like a thick lamppost, but there are too many tourists walking around. You come closer and realize that one person can easily fit inside the post. The lamppost belongs not to an electrician, but to a police officer. Yeah, this is the smallest police station in the world. It was built in the 1930s and used as a watch post. Officers had to sit there one by one and watch Trafalgar Square that always attracted a lot of pickpockets and all kinds of other criminals. The fastest wind speed ever recorded on Earth was related to a hurricane gust. On April 10, 1996, tropical cyclone Olivia was passing by Barrow Island, Western Australia. At one moment, the storm reached the speed of a Category 4 hurricane, 254 miles per hour. That's faster than a Formula One racing car. You can probably imagine how much damage this kind of wind can cause. The only windstorm faster than that is a tornado. The air inside a whirlwind can move at a speed of 300 miles per hour. Unfortunately, there's no sure way to measure tornadic winds. Weather instruments never survived the experience. Oh, and licking your finger and sticking it up in the wind to measure speed also isn't a good idea here, unless you don't mind losing your arm or worse. Here are some more numbers. 35 miles per hour and more, that's the speed of the average blizzard. 50 to 60 miles per hour, that's how fast a severe thunderstorm moves. More than 74 miles per hour is the speed of a powerful tropical hurricane. Up to 400 miles per hour? Wait, do such speeds exist? Yep, but you need to travel to Jupiter to see a storm that speedy. The Great Red Spot is an enormous storm raging in the southern hemisphere of the gas giant. Its top parts are towering more than 5 miles above the surrounding cloud tops. The storm's almost three times as wide as our planet. In 2017, NASA's Juno space probe managed to collect lots of data about the red spot. And it turned out that the monster of a storm went more than 200 miles down into the planet's atmosphere. That's 30 to 100 times deeper than any ocean on Earth. 
But since these measurements were most likely imprecise, the storm's true roots can be reaching even deeper. The Great Red Spot is colder than the rest of the atmosphere, and Jupiter's temperatures are minus 234 degrees Fahrenheit in its upper cloud layers. The closer it is to the core, the hotter it gets. But the highest temperatures ever recorded on the planet were in the atmosphere right above the Great Red Spot. There, the heat can reach 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hotter than lava on our planet. The storm's extreme conditions and turbulence produce gravitational and sound waves. These waves might be responsible for the superheating. The storm itself is also warmer at its bottom than at the top. If you found yourself at its center, you wouldn't be too impressed. But on the edges, the wind speed reaches 300 to 420 miles per hour. That's faster than Earth's tornadoes. Now, this will help you picture the immense force of such winds. On Earth, the wind doesn't have to be faster than 60 miles per hour to lift a person as heavy as 170 pounds from the ground. A wind as fast as 75 miles per hour can uproot large trees, peel off roofs, break windows, and turn over mobile homes. When the wind speed reaches 150, it can send cars flying. Now picture the havoc a storm as powerful as the Great Red Spot can cause on our planet. But could such an enormous anti-cyclone occur on Earth? Luckily, not. Our planet doesn't have the unique conditions needed for the storm to form. Scientists faced lots of challenges when they were trying to understand the mystery that was the Great Red Spot. And it was mostly the fault of the storm's home planet. It's more than a thousand times larger than Earth and over 300 times as massive. Jupiter is a gas giant, which means it consists mostly of fill in the blank. Around the planet's core, there's an ocean of liquid hydrogen. And the atmosphere is also mostly made up of hydrogen and helium. That means Jupiter doesn't have any solid ground, the only thing that could make the storm weaken. Without any friction, the storm has already been churning for centuries. The hot gases in the planet's atmosphere are always moving, rising, falling, and swirling. Just like on our planet, when cooler and hotter gases mix and merge into one another, they form giant circling storms. Astronomers think that once, several enormous storms came together and created the Great Red Spot. And now, it keeps raging by constantly drawing cool gases from below and hot gases from above. Plus, this monster of a storm absorbs other smaller vortices. They make the Great Red Spot even more powerful. Unfortunately, thick clouds on Jupiter don't allow people to see what's going on in the planet's lower atmosphere. Astronomers have been speculating on what may lie beneath the Great Red Spot for decades. Could it be a massive volcano? Unlikely. Jupiter's mostly gas. That's why it doesn't have a crust that could crack and release scorching hot stuff from the planet's interior. Several theories try to explain why the storm has its trademark color. It varies from whitish and pale salmon to orange and brick red. Some scientists believe the answer lies below the Great Red Spot, closer to the planet's surface. A colorless layer of ammonium hydrosulfide might be reacting with cosmic rays or the UV radiation coming from the sun. This somehow gives the spot its pretty red color. But so far, it's just a theory. Astronomers have been observing the Great Red Spot since the 1830s. And for the first time, the storm was spotted in 1665 and described as the permanent spot. In other words, the storm is almost 400 years old. Strangely, it's been shrinking in size since the beginning of the 21st century. In 2019, it began flaking at the edges, with smaller pieces breaking off and vanishing. If this process continues, by 2040, the Great Red Spot will become circular, or it may disappear altogether. The storm isn't only getting smaller, it's also growing taller and getting a more intense orange hue. It's not completely clear why it's happening might be because of a chemical reaction. It occurs when some new material rises to the top layers of the atmosphere from below. The Great Red Spot might be the most famous storm in the solar system, but it's by no means the only one. Even on Jupiter, 
there's a bit less known Little Red Spot. One more anticyclone, but smaller in size. Well, when I say smaller, I mean the thing's not as large as its big sister. But it's still about the size of Earth. Recently, the highest wind speed inside the Little Red Spot has increased up to 400 miles per hour. A storm as wide as our planet rages on Saturn. It's called the Great White Spot. The storm has a tail of white clouds encircling the entire planet. It occurs every 30 years or so, when Saturn's northern hemisphere tilts toward the Sun. This storm indeed starts as a spot, but then it stretches in length. Astronomers have figured out that the Great White Spot is actually a huge system of thunderstorms. At the peak of the storm, lightning can flash more than 10 times per second. But the main mystery about the Great White? It's where it gets its energy from. Some scientists think it may be powered by the sun. Others argue that the storm's cloud pattern only makes sense if there's an internal heat source that can power the winds. Great dark spots on Neptune are massive storms that form in areas with high atmospheric pressure. That's different on Earth. Here, storms appear when the pressure is low. Around the spot's edges, the wind speeds can reach 1,300 miles per hour. Astronomers have observed six dark spots on Neptune so far. These powerful storms get born deep in the planet's atmosphere. And the darker a storm is, the brighter the methane clouds around it are. Another monster-sized storm raging on Saturn looks pretty much like a hurricane or typhoon on our planet. It has an eye and spiraling clouds surrounding it. But compared to Earth's hurricanes, the one on the ring planet is titanic. On Saturn, the eye of the storm is up to 1,250 miles across. The bright clouds closer to the edges of the hurricane are moving at a speed of 330 miles per hour. But one of the most unusual things about this storm is its shape. It has six sides and is known as the hexagon. When astronomers saw the first images with the vortex, they did a double take. The thing was just too similar to our storms. And still, the one whirling on Saturn has an eye that's almost 20 times larger than any people have seen on Earth. The storm also moves four times faster than hurricane winds on our planet. Saturn's atmosphere has little water vapor. How the bizarre hexagon storm is getting by in such conditions is a mystery. Plus, unlike the constantly drifting hurricanes on Earth, the one on Saturn seems to have nowhere to go. For some inexplicable reason, it's stuck at the planet's North Pole. The Earth has three main layers. Two parts of the core, the dense, hot inner core, and the molten outer core. Then comes the mantle. And then follows the thin crust, the surface that supports life as we know it. At least, that's what we thought. Because now, scientists found a new mysterious layer located deep within the solid inner core. Earth's inner core is approximately two-thirds the size of the Moon. And made of nickel and solid iron, it's burning hot. The temperature at the center of our planet is the same as at the surface of the Sun. The outer core can reach almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's difficult to explore it because we can't go there. And it's like looking through a really dirty window of 3,200 miles of molten metal and rocks. But we can rely on laboratory experiments on heated pressurized rocks, signals from seismic waves, and computer models. When an earthquake hits, it sends out seismic shock waves. Those waves travel through layers at a different speed, depending on the direction they go and the material they move through. In the new study, a team of scientists set a data set of 100,000 deep earthquakes. Some of them went over 60 miles below the surface. When an earthquake happens on one side of our planet, scientists track its waves all along to the other side. Waves change when they come to the other side, so scientists try to understand the materials these waves have passed through. They found a new layer in the core of our planet thanks to earthquakes. Normally, shock waves travel along the equator, but down below, they digress and go into different directions, about 60 degrees to the side. When waves pass through the inner core going from north to south, 
they will travel more quickly than waves going through the core parallel to the equator. It's important to understand the core because it creates our magnetic field, which, in turn, protects the planet from things like solar winds that are charged particles coming from the sun. In the 1960s, we discovered the Earth pulsates every 26 seconds. It's like clockwork, a giant heartbeat. The ground is slightly shaking, but we mostly don't feel it. Researchers can still track it. Some of them think the continental shelf comes as a huge wave break under the oceans. For example, the highest part of the North American continent falls off into a deep abyssal plain. One theory says waves hit this spot, producing regular pulses. It's like having all kinds of drums. You hit them with your hands and accidentally slam that one spot that produces the right harmonic bang to rattle our entire planet. If this theory is true, we're lucky there are no more spots like this that can shake the Earth. Other scientists believe the pulsation happens because there's a volcano near the critical spot, the island of Sao Tome in the Bight of Bonny. You're walking, running, and jumping, but when you stop, it always feels like you're standing still. In reality, you're moving even when you're perfectly still because our planet is always on the move. Depending on where you're at, you could be spinning through the universe at more than 1,000 miles per hour. If you're on the equator, you'll move the fastest. Let's say you have a basketball spinning on your finger. Check the ball's equator. A random point on it has farther to go in just one spin than any point near your finger. That means the point on the equator is moving more quickly. The Earth is a planet that recycles all the time. The ground we're walking on is recycled. Our planet's rock cycle turns rocks of one type into another. That's a cycle that goes on and on. The depths of our planet are filled with magma. As magma is going out onto the surface, it hardens into rock. Tectonic processes like volcanic activity, earthquakes, mountain building, and all of the other processes that shape the surface of our planet bring that rock to the Earth's surface. When the rock is on the surface, erosion shapes it and shaves its bits off. Those small particles then get deposited. All the pressure coming from above compacts the particles into sedimentary rocks, like, for example, sandstone. Sedimentary rocks can also end up deeper and deeper under the Earth's surface. Since there's a lot of heat and pressure, they get cooked into metamorphic rocks. They can go back to the surface once again or even end up being re-eroded. Sometimes the crust plates are pushing one under another, and this way, rocks can transform into magma once again. We've explored only 5% of the ocean so far. The ocean itself, as well as life below the seafloor, is still a mystery. The sediments that are underlying our oceans are home to different microorganisms that exist even at depths of 1.5 miles beneath the seafloor. There are microbes hidden deep inside volcanic rocks below the seafloor off of the parts of the Pacific, hidden under 870 feet of sediment. The biosphere under the seafloor is growing extremely slowly compared to life on the surface. Cell division happens every 10 to 1,000 years. Something's different about the Earth's axis. Climate changes and melting glaciers mostly in the regions like the Himalayas and Alaska, made the axis shift. Our planet has two kinds of poles. Are the south and north magnetic poles. They affect, they affect things such as drift and navigation. The axis that the Earth is spinning around is another kind of pole. It shifted a little bit over time, but we don't know exactly why. Researchers realize there are moving masses of water pushing the Earth's axis eastward. Take a basin of water as an example. If you're moving it back and forth, sloshing makes the water move its weight all around. A similar thing is happening on a planetary level. No matter how large an earthquake is, no human could ever feel an earthquake on the opposite side of the Earth, although some people claim they did. In 2013, there was one near the Kuril Islands with a magnitude of 8.5. It went around 400 miles deep. It was so strong, 
people in Australia reported they could feel the ground shaking. The strongest earthquake happened in Chile in 1960 with a magnitude of 9.5. The rupture zone stretched from 311 miles to almost 620 miles along the country's coast. Earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or higher can't happen. The magnitude depends on the length of the fault where it occurs. The longer the fault, the bigger the earthquake. A fault is a break in a part of the planet's crust. It has rocks on both sides, and they move past each other. We haven't found a fault long enough to generate earthquakes with a magnitude of 10 or more. If it happened, it would extend around most of our planet. An earthquake with a magnitude of 12 would require a fault larger than our planet. One side of our planet is getting colder than the other. The Earth has a system that keeps it warm from the inside, a red-hot liquid interior deep below the surface. It spins and, at the same time, generates a magnetic field and gravity. That way, the Earth's core holds the atmosphere closer to the planet's surface. The Earth also absorbs heat from the Sun, mostly on the surface. The heat doesn't spread equally on all parts of the Earth. One side of the planet, the Pacific Hemisphere, is losing heat more quickly than another, the African Hemisphere. This happens because land traps more heat than the surface under the ocean. The seafloor is way thinner than the landmass. Also, the temperature caused by the heat coming from inside the Earth is getting lower because of huge amounts of cold water above it. Clouds are not just like some fluffy distant pieces of cotton. They weigh more than a million pounds and help regulate our planet's temperature. If you take all the water droplets in clouds and bring them to the surface, you could cover the planet with a liquid layer as thin as a human hair. It doesn't seem like a lot, but this water is crucially important for climate. We'd have warmer temperatures if it weren't for the clouds.